Room 237, and I'm back with another Italian horror film review. Now, from what I've reviewed, 1989 was not the best year for Italian horror films. I mean, from Lucio Fulci, we had Enigma. From Sergio Martino, we had American Rickshaw. And this director, Umberto Lenzi, is one that I'm growing more and more respect for, and probably put in my top five Italian directors um, for a while. Like when I did my first Italian marathon, the only film of his I had seen was Nightmare City, which I'm not a fan of, even in like a campy, uh, best of the worst type way. Uh, I know I'm in the very small, or you know, the very small minority of people that are the biggest fan of uh, uh, Nightmare City. But his Gialli, like, uh, I really like Spasmo, really like Seven Bloodstained Orchids. I'm hoping Santa will bring me the Lindsay Baker box set, because I would love to see see all those and have all those. Um, double check. I, I like Nightmare Beach, which is a slasher, not a giallo. And now we have this film from 1989. And... I will say I liked this more than Enigma and uh, American Rickshaw, and it is Hitcher in the Dark, which this is the Blu-ray from uh, uh, Vinegar Syndrome, which they really went all out with their uh, uh, alternate artwork. I'm going to try to show it so it's YouTube safe, but yeah, you can kind of get the idea of what they were trying to show. So. I'm just going to keep it like this for the time being. Now, at first I was thinking this is another case of a popular film in America. This case being The Hitcher with uh, C. Thomas Howell and uh, Rutger Hauer. And then Italy trying to do theirs with an unofficial remake or sequel. But from what I've seen, the only time that really occurred was the German release of this when it was called return of the hitcher regardless of which it's still a silly title because hitcher in the dark most of the scenes are in the day and you know when he picks up uh Josie Bissett who's our female lead when he picks her up in the beginning of the film it's daylight most scenes are in the daylight even the scene at the end with the kind of twist is daylight. Not a whole lot of scenes in the dark. Come to think about it, I don't even remember if she hitchhikes. I think she runs up to him and asks, asks for a ride. But that's not really important. Um, this is kind of going back to Lindsay's spring break kind of uh, setting like he did with Nightmare Beach which is alternately called Welcome to Sp Spring Break because the, the RV that this takes place in is cruising the coast I think during spring break. <laughs> Hits a lot of like beachy type areas. We have a couple side characters that are like you know Zach Morris dude bros uh, of the late 80s but anyway so Alberto Lenzi went as Humphrey Humbert uh, for this film and there's actually a, many people he worked with before in fact uh, Olga Pehar if I pronounce her her name correctly she's credited with the screenplay that's his wife she also appeared in his film Eyeball which I'm also hoping to get for Christmas I really want to see Eyeball also Eaten Alive I, I did enjoy that's another one he did and I still need to see Man from Deep River. And it was pr produced by Joe D'Amato, who people will know from Absurd, Anthropophagus. Uh, at the beginning of this marathon, I reviewed Deep Blood, his uh, shark film. And it was put up by Film Mirage, which I believe is Joe D'Amato's company. Um, yeah, and it stars... Joe Balo as our male lead, Mark Glazer, who would go on to be in Lindsay's Black Demons, which is a film I don't know too much about. And as I've said before, uh, Josie Bissett, this was before she would 
go on uh, to have soap opera fame with uh, a Melrose Place. And I guess she played Robbie Krieger's girlfriend in Oliver Stone's uh, The Doors, which is a film I grew up with. It must have been a very side role because I can't picture her at all. Um, was it? And she was also in, what else was she in that I saw? Was it uh, Witchery? No, no, it wasn't Witchery. But anyway, um, the Italian title translates to Fear in the Dark. And one thing I want to point out is... Um, uh, Shriek Show, they they put out some DVDs where on the top there's a yellow banner where, where it will say Italian Collection or Giallo Collection. Uh, I used to have uh, My Dear Killer on DVD before I got Forgotten Gialli. That said the Giallo Collection. This was released by Shriek Show with the Giallo Collection. It's not a Giallo in any way. <laughs> I mean... We know who the killer is from the very first scene. It's more, uh, it is more of like a 70s grindhouse type film. It even has a very grindhouse type ending, but more of like a captivity type movie. Like I thought it was gonna be more like a Last House on the Left type rape revenge film. It doesn't really go that route. It's not nearly as hardcore as one might expect. In fact, a lot of the more disturbing aspects don't even occur till like the last half hour or so of the film. In fact, uh, Josie Bizet's character of Daniela is very submissive throughout most of uh, 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 the film I don't really buy uh, Balo as Mark Glazer the sort of disturbed almost Norman Batesy type serial killer who picks up young beautiful women as they hitch in his uh, a Winnebago holds them captive until well, it opens up with the kill where he just slits her throat, apparently till he's had enough of them. But then with Daniela, it just keeps going until, well, up until the ending, which, yeah, it, it just keeps going. And actually, with the way the film turns out, spoilers, uh, it's not even like he killed her. It's like she died, then he tried to dispose of her. So... I'm guessing it's because because of his motive, which is that he's madly in love with his mother in like a love-hate relationship, and he tries to turn these women into his mother by cutting their hair like, like hers, <clears throat> having them wear a red dress like hers, calling them her name. Uh, I'm guessing she looked the most and was the most submissive and easiest, I guess. I, it'll make more sense once I get up to that point in the film, but... And the movie almost makes it play out like we're supposed to... Uh, I guess sympathize with Mark more so than Daniela. I mean, there's more suspense scenes dealing with him about to get caught, and not in a way where it's showing her like a suspense scene showing her like she could be saved it's more suspense like he's about to be caught that's really only once or twice but there is a good uh suspense scene dealing with her potentially being saved with a thief on a scooter where i did like how that scene played out i mean it's not a very stylish film uh i i did like half of the music. I mean, some of it is very typical kind of 80s synth type music. But the actual kind of horror music, <clears throat> like, it has uh, has kind of like these drum beats 
that kind of reminded me of Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. But it was done by Carlo Maria Cordio, who, in the parentheses, it says absurd. So I'm guessing he scored absurd, which was Joe D'Amato. But, uh, it says that I don't know if he did these films or if he, because it says it recycled some cues of music from Killing Birds and Witchery. That might have been, been where I saw a Witchery, which I've heard is a good film. Uh, I would like to see it. But anyway, um, Yeah, I don't really know where to start with this because, I mean, it's very straightforward. After that first kill, and then he throws her in, in with the alligators. He stops off at this campground. He witnesses a breakup between this girl and this guy. She runs up to him asking for a ride. And then, out of nowhere, he drugs her. Well, first, he, he starts acting strange. He's very manic. And it gets worse as the film goes on. Like he shows her a picture of who we find out is his mother. But then she's like, okay, so who is she? Because he says her name is uh, Danyashka, it's Russian. And she's trying to ask, you know, what's your relationship with her? Who is she? It's like, is she a ballerina? Is she a spy? And then he like grabs the picture out of her hands, like pulls over and he's all angry. You have a lot of manic episodes like that. Up until about the last half hour, then it's pretty, you know, consistently psycho. Through, <laughs> not the film, hit, hit, he's psychotic. And you know, he offers her a thermos of coke. Then when she drinks it, she passes out. She wakes up handcuffed. I mean, it goes at a very good pace. It, it's never boring. I'm always curious to see how it goes. Eventually, you know. During like her first escape, she makes it to a payphone and calls her sister, says she's been abducted. And then she calls her, I guess now, ex, Kevin. <clears throat> so then there's this subplot of him trying to find her, which through very, very <laughs> brushes of extreme luck, does he eventually able to find the RV and her. But I mean, like, he keeps drugging her, then waking her up. And at one point, he, he cuts her hair very short, like his mother's. There's one point where she even uh, seduces him. Like, she's not handcuffed, and it's not a plan to, like, kind of incapacitate or do something while he's naked and vulnerable. Like, she's actually trying to seduce him. He can't perform. He gets very angry with himself. Then when he runs outside in the rain, that's when she tries to drive off. It gets the RV stuck. And then eventually they have like this little birthday party where she wears the dress he gives her. And then he keeps calling her a whore, asking her about her sexual past. Acting, acting like a very jealous boyfriend and then just tells her to go to sleep. I mean, and with all that, I'm like, I, I am kind of curious to see where this goes. I mean, I guess the first major turn would be, I think it's after that birthday party, birthday party. She gets up, he's asleep. Yeah, it is, because he tells her to go to bed. He's sleeping. The door is chained shut. And she finds his Polaroids of all the pictures of her passed out, naked. All his dead victims realizes they all have the same haircut. They're in the same poses. They're all killed the same way. And realizes she's probably going to be next. And they made a deal where if she celebrates her birthday with him, he has to let her go the next day. He doesn't hold up. And I, 
I will say that part where she finds the Polaroids, that really is sort of the turning point of the film. And the stakes are much higher because that's when she really notices the threat and what's at stake. Like, it's not just some guy that wants to hold her captive. Uh, some very young looking guy that doesn't look... Uh, I did have a hard time buying him as this sort of roaming serial killer that... I mean, it's not a bad performance, but... And while she's looking through the portfolios, it, the portfolio, Polaroids, it does have kind of that almost Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer type music that I really like. So that's when he chains her up again, this time hands and feet. He has to go get, I think it's a timing belt for the RV. And one of the best uh, uh, suspense scenes <clears throat> is some biker dude on a scooter pulls up. He thinks it's just this lone RV. She has her mouth taped shut. She's trying to kick the vodka bottle so he can hear it and then come in. But he sees a CD player <laughs> on the passenger seat. So just when she kicks it over, that's when he punches through the window. So the glass breaks at the same time. And then he just bails. And again, stroke of luck, that guy, Kevin. Oh, because he's driving around asking, you know, have you seen a guy with, he thinks it might be him. Because I can't remember. First, he's thinking RV because he sees a couple of his friends and they say, oh, yeah, I saw her get in an RV back at the campground. And then he assumes it must be that guy because they keep saying weird looking sunglasses. They're Ray-Bans. <clears throat> and I don't remember him using his portable CD player in the beginning, but he sees the guy that stole it and he recognizes it. So he pays the guy to bring him to the RV. And so he gets in, he frees her. And again, stroke of luck. How <laughs> just perfect timing how he was able to find the RV and her. And so then I thought, okay, because this was before I did some reading and I saw that really only in Germany is it called Return of the Hitcher? And that really being its only tie to the uh, Rudger Hauer film. So, I mean, I didn't think it was a sequel or a remake to begin with. Plus, the roles are reversed. The driver is now, you know, the cat. And the person hitchhiking is uh, the mouse. But I thought at this point, because this is like an hour in, when Kevin saves Daniela, saves, <clears throat> it seems like they're going to get away. And I thought, okay, now it's going to be more like the hitcher. Now it's going to be... You know this road cat and mouse game but no he, he grabs this gun which he has like two guns he has a revolver and a nine millimeter the revolver she uses in the beginning when the first time she tries to get away but we see it's just blanks now he has a nine millimeter and he tells them to get back in the rv and he has them you know handcuffed in certain uh, like he's in the kitchen area she's in the back bedroom and you do have this long sequence where he's going back and forth between torturing them for the reaction of the other person and I did like this scene you know I like how he cuts the tape off Kevin's mouth in such a way that it gives him like half a Half of a Glasgow grin, like he's cut right here. And of course, he get he gets mad when she shows mercy for Kevin. He's like, "Oh, you're worried your little friend's getting hurt. Oh, you know, you, your whore is worried that you'll never be able to fuck her again. You know, just totally, <laughs> kind of like the nice guy of delusion. You know, you're just like all the rest. You're just a filthy whore." And so he's, he like stabs him a couple times. He's gonna, I think he's gonna carve pig in his chest or RIP. Uh, I didn't really see. 
And then, you know, he's going to, like, rape her in front of him. But eventually, it gets to the point where he just kills the, the boyfriend. Finally, when the guy says, I love you, she says, I love you too. That's what really sets him over the edge. Kills the boyfriend. And then this is a scene that was almost right out of We're the Millers. Because there's like a, a roadblock where there was a bank robbery so the cops are checking all the vehicles because one guy got away and there's blood coming like dripping out of his door onto the street and it, it, it's like downtown too so right when it's about his turn they get radioed saying everything's fine they got the guy can go away I was like that was ultra convenient that it reminded me of where the Millers but it really did have like a um, a grindhouse type twist to it because uh, you no know, one the whole RV captive like serial killer almost last house on the left but very very tame like not really it really did have that 70s grindhouse vibe but in in the late 80s but it did have a grindhouse ending where we have you know this twist the now almost like the i spit on your grave type ending where spoilers if you haven't seen it i mean i'm not gonna put the spoiler screen up it's not like a giallo you you can probably tell where it's going but he goes to dispose of kevin in a junkyard and he sees that daniela has passed away as well probably I mean, I don't know how many days this takes place over, two or three days, but I figured he must have thought it was like an overdose of the drugs he keeps giving her to knock her out. He's able to weld Kevin shut, his body shut in a trunk in the junkyard. He just tosses her in a trunk and then bails. And then we see him with his dad. His dad is, you know, the last name Glazer. It's kind of like uh, Hilton Hotel it's, it's like this big hotel tycoon they see on the news that well <clears throat> uh, it says the body of a young man in a junkyard has been welded shut but I think they say two bodies but you know his, he shuts the TV off first and he decides to go for another uh, coast cruise you know, just another, he, he wants to go through it all again. Sees this one woman, he picks her up, but we don't see who it is. And then, just like earlier, because in the beginning of the scene, in the beginning of the film when Daniela gets in, Kevin is like right behind him, honking, so he has to like wave him around. Now it's like these two bikers, they're kind of harassing him, so then they finally go around. So he pulls over, he takes out the thermos, He's like, here, you want some coke? And then that's when she turns around with the gun. And he's like, oh no, I, I was pretending to be dead. I faked it. And I don't want any coke because I don't want to fall asleep again. And also very grindhousey because she finally pulls the trigger. And it's like all these freeze frames of like... Then like just up... More freeze frames like... Uh, uh, up close of her so yeah it has like that I spit on your grave type where the killer or bad guy gets his just desserts from the victim so yeah it feels like that 70s like, captive almost rape revenge but not really rape revenge but that kind of film uh, grindhouse type film but about 17 years too late like I spit on a grave like uh, 11 years too late but very 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 tame I will have to say they could have found a better wig for her because she has very blonde hair but then when they cut it one like the scene when she's uh, seducing him it looks like a wig but it's also like dark brown almost like with gray the acting isn't terrible <clears throat> I mean, 
or at least I should say it kind of grew on me or I was able to get used to it but yeah there was definitely enough to keep me hooked I was eager to see where it was gonna go you know because it kind of you know starts off like okay things are bad but then she seems kind of happy and okay probably because there's that glimmer of hope and she doesn't quite know how dangerous this guy is but she can tell he's unhinged, but she seems okay with him, even tries to seduce him. Then she finds the Polaroids, and that's the turning point. But then I would say when, when Kevin comes to rescue her, and, and like I thought, okay, now we're gonna get the cat and mouse final half hour, like the Hitcher, but no, it was more just three people in the RV. And I, thinking back now, I probably should have thought, oh yeah, it's obvious that she's not dead. Because, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, he welded the, the first trunk. And then, yeah, he didn't weld it because someone was coming. And he had a bail. But it is kind of more convenient, so it can happen later. But, I mean, I, I didn't mind this film. I've seen way, way worse <laughs> Italian horror films that are very brightly lit and don't really look like horror films. I mean, go back to like American Rickshaw. Very bright daytime almost the whole time. This is a much better film. But yeah, I thought it was, you know, it <clears throat> it, it had enough to keep me interested. Uh, definitely liked the music more and say American Rickshaw. I liked at least half the music, more horror oriented music. Even though I didn't really buy Balo at first as the psycho, I thought his performance was kind of uneven. It did kind of even out as it went on. And then he, it's like he was psycho with them. And then to other people, he, he could play normal enough, but you could tell he was masked. And it, he got more believable as it went on. But yeah, uh, I thought it was, you know, at the very least, a solid Umberto Lindsay film. <clears throat> and yeah, this is a guy I want to see more films of. I, I'm really hoping to get the Lindsay Baker Complete Giallo box set. I would love to get that. But yeah, not too much to say style-wise or anything else or even plot-wise, really. But I've gone on for almost a half hour, so... Yeah, that's Umberto Lenzi's Hitcher in the Dark. I got a couple more Italian horror and giallo films. I think I've got two gialli left and a couple horror films. So uh, stay tuned for those and thank you for watching. Oh, oh.